So welcome to the session on graduate students putting history into action. Um, before we hear from them, before I introduce each of them, um, I thought I'd say a few things about history and public life. It seems to me that virtually every contemporary political debate uh, in the United States is about a debate about the past. Um, or perhaps a debate about how the past, in one way or another, influences the present. So foreign policy debates turn time and time again on the Munich analogy or the Vietnam analogy. I think now enough time has passed that they're turning on the 9-11 and the invasion of Iraq uh, analogies. The immigration debate um, often involves uh, policymakers making reference to the immigration of 100 years ago, uh, constructing a narrative about that immigration that most scholars of immigration uh, find uh, confounding or worse, a narrative that almost always focuses entirely on European immigrants to the U.S. Uh, in the Gulf of East Asian immigrants altogether. Uh, the debates surrounding gay marriage um, often involves references to a traditional family or a traditional form of marriage. Um, debates surrounding policing and mass incarceration inevitably make reference to the crime spike of the 1960s and 1970s, as well as the spike in the use of narcotics during that period. Um, there are, of course, um, conservatives who have made explicit reference to the past, members of the Tea Party above all, um, opponents of gun control often invoke the Second Amendment or a certain understanding of the Second Amendment to the Constitution. Um, the Michael Brown and Eric Garner cases have, uh, have brought with them a discussion of the legacy of the Civil Rights Movement, which is of course itself a contested uh, story in contemporary public life, as we can see in the debate over the film Selma and its representation of the relationship between LBJ and, uh, and MLK. Uh, indeed, King's legacy is fought over every year at the time of the King holiday with conservatives um, fashioning King as um, an advocate of race-neutral policies. Um, and uh, many radicals trying to remind Americans um, of the king who denounced the Vietnam War a year before his murder, the king who was planning a poor people's campaign, the king who was increasingly radicalized in the last years of his life. And then uh, there are many religious believers who try mightily to remind Americans that king was a believer, that he believed that he was bearing the cross as a and then uh, there are contemporary political debates that reference the past even when <coughs> participants seem not to be aware that they are doing so. Um, so it may well be the case that uh, the Affordable Care Act will be saved from oblivion um, because one member of the Supreme Court believes that the plaintiffs who are challenging the ACA uh, <laughs> might pose a threat to states' rights. Um, so only in a world without irony or a country without <laughs> historical memory um, would the signature accomplishment of the nation's first black president uh, conceivably be rescued by an appeal to states' rights. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there are debates, political debates, about history and commemoration. Um, so there are politicians in the state of Oklahoma who want to ban the AP exam because, in their view, it presents too negative a view of American history. Um, and then on the other side, um, anti-war activists from the Vietnam era, joined by a good many historians, have challenged the Pentagon's plan for an official commemoration of the Vietnam War uh, to be held this year, um, and in fact have, have managed to get some concessions from the Pentagon. Uh, the initial website for that commemoration, among other things, uh, referred to the My Lai massacre as the My Lai incident. Um, I checked the website earlier today, and it seemed to me that there were other aspects of the war still missing. Searching for the word uh, casualties or deaths uh, got me nowhere. 
Hmm. Uh, historians obviously have an obligation to intervene in debates that are specifically about how we remember the past, but I think we have an obligation to intervene in public debates more generally because they uh, so clearly resonate um, with um, uh, past events. Um, historians, of course, should step in whenever possible and correct fallacies, correct mistaken uh, claims about the past. But I think beyond that, historians um, have an obligation and also an opportunity to remind Americans of the nuances of past events, of the contingencies of history, and uh, in so doing, break through the black and white self-righteous narratives um, that so many people deploy when they draw on the past to make political points today. And I'm sorry to say that historians are not altogether uh, innocent of, of uh, that kind of use of the past. Um, historians, it seemed to me, have an opportunity to enter into conversation with other citizens in a spirit of humility and a shared inquiry. Um, not bringing the, the past or a true account of history to the benighted masses, but rather to enter into a conversation with the public that actually cares about the past. Um, and I think some of the work that's been done about the relationship between history and memory is motivated by that kind of concern. A recognition of the complexity of the past, of the ways in which flawed human beings in the past, flawed human beings like ourselves, um, negotiated the challenges that they faced in their lives, may actually have a, a certain benefit for contemporary public debates, insofar as I think a recognition of, uh, of that, uh, that uh, human predicament may temper the uh, simplistic um, uh, narratives that dominate uh, contemporary public rhetoric. Historians are in a good position to intervene in uh, public debates in this way, um, from Thucydides uh, to the present. Uh, many historians at their best, it seems to me, have understood history as a civic practice, um, as a civic art. Um, and there is a great tradition at Columbia of historians who thought about their craft in that way. Uh, certainly faculty, um, um, Charles Beard, through Richard Hostadter, to many members of the history department today, have, uh, have practiced history with an eye to contemporary debates, asking questions that are shaped by matters of pressing contemporary concern, and have intervened in debates in useful ways. And of course, there's a long history of uh, graduate students and PhDs produced by, um, by this program who have also um, approach the study of the past with an eye to uh, matters of pressing uh, public concern, um, whether it's Gerda Lerner, uh, Howard Zinn, uh, Christopher Lash, G. Genovese, it's a long and distinguished list of Columbia PhDs um, who've made a, a great mark as historians, but also uh, an important mark as public actors. Um, our graduate students today, I think, um, are very much heirs to that tradition, keeping it alive um, in all sorts of ways. Um, you've heard about what other graduate students have done. These three will tell us about their, uh, their work. Um, our first speaker is Romeo Guzman, who is a historian of transnational Latin America, who is working on the history of the Mexican-American generation. And he will speak to, him, to us about his experience as a co-director of the South El Monte Arts Hassan, which combines art, history, and community service. Uh, he'll be followed by Katie Lasdow, who is a scholar of early North American history and a past president of the Graduate History Association here at Columbia. She will be talking with us about her experience using history in cities and in particular, her work as a tour guide uh, with Big Onion and the Brooklyn Historical Society. And then George Amwaf, a historian of public health, will speak with, with us about his involvement in the post-Ferguson and post-Eric Garner Black Lives Matter campaign. 
So um, join me in welcoming Francis. So I guess we'll mail you a chair. I'm really excited to be here. I haven't lived here for a couple years, uh, so it's really great to be back. I want to start uh, by saying that I think I'm the only grad student that's directing the public history project. Now, I'll repeat that. I think I'm the only person in the department that's directing the graduate, that's directing the public history project. And I want to follow with a confession. Um, I don't know the history of public history, and I definitely don't know the historiography. So if I were to take an oral question or an oral exam, I would fail, right? Um, and I, I start with that for a couple different reasons. One is because uh, my engagement with public history is coming from social arts practice, right? It's coming from outside of academia in some ways, outside of the history department. And I also want to emphasize um, the importance of flexibility, collaboration, and just doing the work, right? Um, this is a project that starts before the history action is founded um, and before there's funding for graduate student projects. Um, and the other thing I really want to sort of emphasize is is that we sort of, and this is sort of a question for, a larger question, but how, how do we how do we start building projects, right, as opposed to sort of participating in them as graduate students? Um, so because this is a project outside of, in some ways, Colombia, I want to sort of really ground you guys in South Edmonton. South Edmonton is a city about 15 miles um, outside of downtown, so it's east of East LA. Does anyone know um, anything about East LA? <laughs> okay, so we have some sets, but those of you don't, um, East LA is sort of the Chicano cultural place, so there are institutions, there is a cultural renaissance. Anything east of that is sort of devoid of institutions. So there aren't any cultural institutions, intellectual institutions. Um, there's not a lot of leadership engagement with these types of communities. So we're sort of out there, right? Um, so I'll just start a little bit about the South Dakota Arts Arts House. So we're an arts collective. Um, we're writers, academics, uh, we're journalists. Um, we're swap meet vendors, but really we're sort of a loose, co loose collaboration of people. So we, do, we sort of develop a project and then we sort of bring people in, into that. So I'll give you guys a sense of what that looks like. This was a, a photo project we did in 2012, I think. Um, and it was called How's the Water? Does that sound familiar to anybody? How's the Water? So, so it's from Foster Wallace, right? Uh, he gave a commencement speech and he, he sort of asked the students how the water. And the idea is that uh, it's a story about fish. And one of them says to them, how's the water? And he's like, hey, what the fuck is water, right? Um, so we invited photographers that were from our community. We invited four photographers, um, recent graduates from, uh, from CalArts, and we asked them to take photographs and to just sort of tell us what our community looks like. And then we threw up a public exhibit. We threw it in our driveway. This is actually our home. Um, and there's a wall, a little driveway, we just threw up all this. Our VR made food for us, and basically the community was invited to this, right? After that project, um, we did something called Activate Vacant, and for that, we invited artists um, to take over vacant houses. Uh, so we had a photographer, we had a poet, um, Jitsu Rowan and Hugh Wayne, a Jitsu student here, um, came out as well. And that was really interesting. We said, Jitsu, look, if you can get to LA, like, we'll feed you and we'll house you. And he's like, all right, well, let me scrap some money together. So again, it speaks to sort of this, this will to just do things, right? And I want to talk a little bit about this here. Um, for those of you who, who are Spanish speakers or read Spanish, I thought Asan means um, my heart, right? But for those of you who speak Spanish, know that I corazón is like the word dude, and it has multiple meanings, and it depends how you say it, right? So this is a green tar um, that covers a spot, a vacant lot that's been vacant for years and years and years. And this is the only street that takes you to the freeway. So basically we threw up something that can mean multiple things to the community members who constantly have to leave uh, their city to go work. Right? So it became a sort of public billboard for, for community. And what was really exciting about this is that um, it's sort of a sculpture written out of white plastic bags from the artist's home. So it was something that was made in the living room with her mom and with her sister um, and with her toddler. And I'll give you guys a, a short little detail. So it, it's literally sort of braided into it. And what's really great about this is that the cops drove by and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to read it, right? And I think Sidifus also didn't know how to read it. It's not graffiti. Um, and this is a literary event that we had. It's called Birthday Party for Our Books. Um, one of our really good friends wrote a book. And it was about her mom and her dad. And her dad had another wife in Mexico. Um, and she wrote a book about it. So we went to a reading at downtown LA. And she read about that. And her mom was there, and we all know her mom. 
she calls me for a that's no more no sign of affection. And it was really uncomfortable. It was like there was one short, fat Mexican lady amongst a bunch of white middle class, sort of 20 to 30, 40 year old people, right? So um, we thought, how do we create spaces in which the subjects of our books are comfortable? And that's really important, right? How, how do we create a space in which the people that we're talking about, the objects, feel comfortable in those spaces? Um, so what we did, we said, okay, well, we're all migrants. Like, what, what, what's a good weekend for us? Like, all right, we can go to Quinceañera or a party. So we're like, all right, so let's organize a book reading around the party. So the entire structure of the book reading followed a regular party. So one of the things that we did, for example, was we had a typewriter, um, and we had kids and grown-ups and real writers, but real writers and like well-known poets, um, write poetry, uh, put it in a little piece of paper, fold it up, and stick it in the piñata. And we broke the piñata, right? So that was a sort of playful way in which everyone got to participate in literature, and it was also a way in which we could have families at this event, right? ultimately to book about families. Um, so East of East, um, comes from the sort of philosophy or the values or the, the approach really comes from some maps of work in the community, right? And we're really invested in building reciprocal relationships between historians and the public. Um, so what we mean by that is we try to place our community at the center of knowledge production from the beginning to the end. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, that also means that we try to find multiple homes for primary and secondary sources that will become a little bit clearer. Um, but in some ways what that means is that we want these things to emerge in dissertations, but we also want them to emerge in the classroom. Um, we also want them to emerge in just regular journalism, right? And in our projects. And this is probably the, the I mean, the, what we might have to offer to other public history projects is that we also imagine history being able to transform the public landscape. Um, and, and that obviously is more expensive, but that's one of the things that I think so not can offer to other public history So um, East of East African Unitarians is founded by LA City Department of Social Affairs. Um, we asked for money, and we're not in LA City, but they gave it to us. And what we did is we brought friends from Mexico City who were working on the digital archive, um, the Marlon Archive in Mexico City, uh, La Casa de Ochoa, and we said, hey guys, we don't know what an archive looks like, but we care about stories, so let's like, work together. So we lived together for about three weeks, and we did all the histories, we did talks and lectures, um, we just typed documents, and we did creative writing. So, Ideally, when all these things come together, um, the way it looks like is we'll do some oral histories, I'll give them to somebody, they'll write an essay, we'll take that essay, then we'll give a talk, and then we'll invite them to tell us more about that particular moment. So in this way, we're really just facilitators, right? I mean, we're, we bring in our expertise, but at the end of the day, the, the communities come before and after the secondary material, right? I could sort of like tell you guys like who's, where we've sort of shown up, who's, talked about us or how many oral histories we've done, but I think that stuff's a little boring. So what I wanted to do is, is share some of these like nuggets, right? This is a guy um, who was a former Bracero. Uh, I think you all know what a Bracero is, but just a contract length from 1940 to 1960. He ended up selling at Um And when we interviewed him, he wouldn't talk to us. He would just sit. So if you asked him a question, he would just sit, right? So the whole oral history is him, like 12 tracks of songs. The other really interesting thing about him is that he's a zine maker. Um, so he made these really awesome zines, and they have his corridos, and there's like a video about Monica Lewinsky, and his sort of take on that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a sort of migrant songwriter, bookmaker, who has very clear ideas about history and how that's operating. Mm -hmm. um, El Monte is an interesting city in that it emerges in the historiography in certain periods. So one of those periods is um, the 40s and 50s and 60s around Beijing Stadium. It was the first multiracial all-age dance club in LA. Um, El Monte didn't have the same ordinances, so what that meant is that everyone from LA came all the way to El Monte because it was close enough. So it's a really sort of important space. Um, and one of the key figures to emerge from that is someone named Art LaBeau. If, if anyone's from California, you that the name will Bell. Not, maybe not, but... Um, so what we did here is we did an interview with Art LaBeau, um, and then we shared that interview with community members. And what we were able to do um, is uh, these three figures here played Legion Stadium before it was cool. 
And once it became popular, they were erased, and they became a lot of play those kids, right? The figure on the right is uh, Ruben from Ruben and the Jets. He played the last show on the station. So from this one oral history, we then organized an event where we were able to sort of get both ends of this, of this history, right, this moment. One of the challenges of doing public history um, is get, to get community buy-in. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate at Columbia, which means something to a lot of you guys, but to most people it doesn't mean anything. Um, and in fact, it, it, could be little, it could be a little bit suspicious. Like, why haven't I seen you at the city hall meeting? Well, because I'm busy, man. Like, I'm not, I don't live here, you know? I'm in New York, or I'm in the city, or I'm in DC. Um, but once the city did finally buy in, they asked, well, what do you want? You know, I said, look, just, we don't want money. Just give us, like, an office or something. So that's all right, we'll give you an office. So they gave us their basement. Um, and in their basement, at some point, they said, you know what, by the way, all those boxes, like, if you guys want to look for them, go ahead. So we did, and um, those boxes happened to be their archive. <laughs> and I don't think they know it's, that it's their archive, but it is. <laughs> uh, and I haven't shown this to them, so maybe, um, <laughs> maybe don't say anything about this one. But, uh, does anyone recognize or know what the thing on the left is, the sort of inventory form? It's hard to read, right? What is this say, though? Okay, so basically, these are graffiti inventory forms. So if someone tags on a telephone pole, and then I call to complain about it, the person who goes to paint it over has to fill out this form, which tells us things like where it was done, um, the length, the height, and then the person you know, who has to paint this becomes an artist in some ways because they have to copy as closely as possible the actual tag. Um, <laughs> This inventory form is from 1996. So this is pre-Facebook, uh, pre-Instagram, pre-MySpace, and pre-Digital Conference, right? Um, we have like hundreds of these. In addition to this stuff, we also found these really interesting um, applications. The city of Southern Monte gets founded in 1958, and for some reason they win a bunch of awards. And really what it is, it's the city's so small that it's easy to do community projects. It's easy to clean up, it's easy to do graffiti stuff, it's easy to do youth programming. So they won a bunch of national awards. Um, and in this archive, we found applications which basically tell us this activist history of the Monte that's now been forgotten. So we scanned a bunch of this stuff. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, so to talk a little bit about the, the way in which Columbia students have emerged and other people have emerged is one big part of the archive project has been a reader, um, which is basically a column that we now have on KCUT. Um, and we have about 30 essays that are 2,000 to 3,000 words, right? And again, you know, we'll find material and I'll be like, hey Nick, um, here's some material, man. Like, I, I know you don't know anything about LA, I know you know less about something like that, but I know you know about urban history and like cities. So here's an essay, write some stuff for us. Um, and we've been able to write from, we've been able to write sort of, you know, political, social events, but really we've been able to write about Indigenous South and Monte, so sort of the indigenous people that were there, all the way to punk, you know, five years ago, right? So it's sort of a big, uh, big sort of stretch. Um, and you know, our, our contributors include faculty, uh, local community members, activists, and again, a ton of PhD students. The reader's edited by myself, Alex Cummings, who's an alumni from here, uh, PhD, Kermit Chagosa, who's a writer, and Ryan Rack, who's a journalist. So we're, we're really happy that Columbia's supported us. Um, we flew out Columbia through the half grant, flew out Nick, Jervik, and Daniel Morales, they're both PhD students here, and they had both already written essays for us. So it was a really great sort of collaboration. Um, so what we did, we just applied our model to this, right? So both Nick and Danny went to the high school, they gave talks, they had conversations with the kids. Um, that's Nick at Top of Monte. And then we hosted events. Um, and at, at these events, the kids shadowed us during the oral histories. Um, and we also had Nick and Danny give like talks and lectures. For more anything, we had people bring in photographs, bring in documents, and give us more oral histories. We also, though, um, and I'll focus on, on Nick, uh, it's a little more interesting. Um, we also showed some of the archival material that we had seen that no one had community members or like, completely oblivious to this stuff. So one of those is this huge photo album, which is our application for the National, the national Award. Um, so it's this big, big album, and it's basically the city showing off what they've done, right? We also, in our time in the basement, um, 
found 16 millimeter film reel, which is a promotional video for the award. Um, and that's the credits. That's the actual credits of the film. The film's like in 1976, it has a white veil over voice talking about gangs and something like that and how something like is trying to reform itself or whatever. Um, and in addition, it's staged. So you have gang members like running happily in the street and jumping up, right? So it's a very weird, funky, um, there's this tension between like this whiteness and this like unity, but also this sort of progressiveness in this weird way, which the tagging sort of embodies. The other thing that happens in this video, though, is um, it's a historical record of a time that's been lost. And one of the things that's been lost are these murals. There was a mural project in 1976, um, and they were done in the public and someone's sidewalk, and, you know, someone's neighborhood, so they were completely lost. We don't know where they were. Um, we've been able to find the director of the art project and interview him. Um, but one of the things we've been able to share these images uh, with me, you know, so I'm going to show a couple. Of this is one of the murals. Um, and it might be kind of hard to, to recognize, but does anyone, it's a replica of something in LA. Um, does, does, it, does anyone know what it might, what it is? Okay, that, that's, that's a really good guess. That's, that's a really good guess. Anyone? Do we have any art historians here? Any LA historians? It's a tropical America. Yeah, exactly, thank you. So it's, uh, it's Agoros Siqueiros, 1932, um, right, which was, then in 1932, it gets whitewashed and it doesn't emerge again until 2000. So, Little South and Monte. Little South and Monte has a replica of Siqueiros in 76, and then it gets lost to history. The Siqueiros one is now revived, right? But the sort of, you know, it's just an amazing moment for this little city. After we showed the 60 millimeter film reel, we, we actually read it a machine, so we projected it on the way it was originally supposed to be seen, we had a community discussion um, about the future of South of Monte. And I wrote this down so I wouldn't mess up the temporalities. Um, you know, the film uh, captured more than just the present, the projected ideas and hopes for the future. On a rainy Saturday in South of Monte, community members talked about their own hopes for the future. They did this in dialogue, not just with the past, but with previous visions of the future. We, we, in addition to the conversation, um, the people who came out were high school students, um, librarians, uh, former residents that were there before the, the city was founded, and elected officials. And we asked them to sort of fill out these little cards, right? Um, and you know, one of the high school students wrote more murals, right? And sort of bubbly text. <laughs> And I just wanted to finish off by talking about uh, what's next, right? Um, obviously, we'd love to do a mural. Um, and that's NEA, NEH, I mean, those are easy sort of grants to, to apply for. Um, and the stories there, right? But one of the things that's happened as we published more essays and as cases to speak about is that there's been a lot of excitement from recent graduates um, who are from that community. Um, two of us are directed by high school teachers. There's a lot of excitement there. And because we have at least 10 grad students that are either editing or, or writing essays for us, we really have to think about, can Columbia participate in creating ethnic studies in South of Monte and Monte? We've already done the labor, we already have the primary sources, we already have the secondary sources, right? At a moment where ethnic studies are being challenged, where, you know, in Arizona, um, but also at a moment where people are fighting actively for it, I think, you know, we might think about what our responsibility is as both historians, as academics, as History, history, history. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Lasdow. I'm a third year doctoral student here at Columbia University. And this year, I've been fortunate to be among um, the wonderful group of organizers and, uh, and both students and faculty um, helping to make history in action possible at the university, um, and also part of an inaugural cohort of students who have been awarded History in Action Project Awards, uh, Nick, Danny among them, uh, Muki as well. Um, and we've been able to uh, take some of our uh, passion for History in Action and bring it out into the community. So today I thought I would talk um, specifically to the graduate students in the audience. I've noticed over the afternoon today some great questions about, you know, sort of resume building and how do you get there and how do you get started and what do you do? <laughs> um, 
I'm really interested in this, but I don't know what to do. Um, and I promise this is not going to be like, Katie reads her resume, or both of an audience. Um, but I thought that perhaps uh, this might be a way to think about um, ways that we can all get involved in this initiative um, in ways both big and small. Um, so just a little bit about me and my background. Uh, prior to history at Columbia, I have a background in history from the College of William and Mary, um, in addition to a certificate in museum studies historic preservation, and public history. Uh, from there, I headed on over the mountains to Charlottesville, uh, where I pursued a master's degree in architectural history in the School of Architecture. And it was there that I um, really got a feel for what it looks like to do history in the company of designers, of architects, uh, urban planners, landscape designers, you name it. And I've been fortunate that Columbia has welcomed that background with open arms. Before I went to graduate school, I spent some time working outside of the academy, first uh, for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, doing architectural field work um, with their team, going out, crawling around in old barns, exploring plantation houses, uh, drawing slave quarters, carriage houses, um, pen, uh, pencil, tape measure, boots, <laughs> you name it. Uh, it, was a, it was a really fun experience. Um, I then worked as a museum educator um, in Washington, D.C. for the White House Historical Association inside uh, the Stephen Decatur House, which is a Benjamin Henry Latrobe designed building in Washington. Um, here in New York, I work as a tour guide for Big Onion Walking Tours, um, which some of the uh, prospective stu admitted students, I should say, admitted students, uh, uh, might have had the opportunity to join Nick this morning on a tour. Um, but I also work for the Brooklyn Historical and that's uh, where I will pick up today. Um, so I've always been a little bit quirky in regards to how I think about doing history. Um, and perhaps as an early Americanist, uh, I'm particularly in, uh, in line with some of these quirkier ways of doing history because a lot of our source material uh, doesn't come from books or documents. You have to get creative with where you look. Um, and for me, architectural history has been uh, one of the prime ways that I try to figure out some of the questions that arise while I'm doing research. Um, architectural history field work, going out and studying buildings, taking measurements, doing drawings, um, looking for evidence of change over time, our big historian uh, quest, um, and trying to figure out why a place looks the way it does simply through the materials that present themselves on the ground. And I think that my work as a historian, a tour guide, a museum educator, whatever you want to call me, uh, involves a, a variety of skills. Um, and these skills might at times seem a little bit disjointed, but through history and action, it has shown me that in fact, uh, they all come together um, in a way to break things, complex ideas down into their component parts. So this uh, image behind me here is a picture of the Empire Stores Warehouse in Brooklyn. Um, it's located in Dumbo, immediately adjacent to the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, the Jane Carousel is, is right out in front. And um, back in 2011, 2012, the Brooklyn Historical Society um, joined together with um, West Elm, the home decor company, um, and the developer Manhattan, uh, Midtown Equities to help redesign this building uh, into both a retail office and uh, museum space. And BHS has been granted 3,000 square feet inside this building um, for a museum. And I've been fortunate through the History and Action Program to be a part of that team. When this project is done, hopefully um, within the next year, the building's going to look something like this. This is actually an old, older rendering um, where you see those trees is now an open courtyard. Um, but there will be restaurants, there will be a roof garden. Um, it's going to be pretty incredible. Um, and BHS will be in there with an exhibit uh, specifically related to the history of the Brooklyn waterfront um, and the waterfront's change over time. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in just a minute. Um, another, another way that I have come to sort of think about the way that I do history as a graduate student and in the public is sort of thinking about, you know, what is the public? What do we mean when we say the public? And 
And I find that through my experiences with walking tours especially, um, when people ask the big questions, um, the questions like, you know, why did the American Revolution happen? Or, you know, why do people think a certain way about X subject matter? Or why does this street or this building or this city look and feel the way that it does to me? Um, what I think, and this has come up actually today, um, I think what people are looking for when they ask those questions is, is context. They want to know, you know, how did we get here? And, and how does my experience right now uh, relate to what was here before? And, and I think exhibits like the one that we're working on at Brooklyn Historical are going to aim to answer some of those questions by tracing uh, Brooklyn's waterfront from the Ice Age to today. Um, we will help people confront how they interact with the question of how do I stand in relation to the past. And at its core, I think that history in action can mean a variety of different things, but for me, it means face-to-face -face collaboration and conversation with museum professionals and individuals interested in the history of their city or their neighborhood. And today I've noticed a larger theme about people discussing you know, our audience's comfort or discomfort with particular moments in history. And, and I think that comfort uh, means meeting people where they are in regards to a particular historical moment and challenging them to think a little bit deeper and confront some of their misconceptions, prejudices, or misunderstandings to come to a fuller picture of the past and how history informs our present. I like to think that often when I'm leading a tour or I'm helping to collaborate with this, this exhibit, we're, we're pushing people just enough that they feel a little bit uncomfortable, that they might almost be offended, but they're not so offended that it shuts down the conversation. That it causes them to say, all right, well, I'm not sure I really agree with this. I'm really uncomfortable with this information that you're giving me, but I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to talk. And two examples um, in my experience where this happened, um, for instance, right now, for the waterfront project, one of the things that we're hoping to do, cross your fingers if this works out, um, is the possibility of installing a webcam over one of the drainage pipes into the East River. So that when people come into the exhibit and they trace the story of the waterfront and they learn about ecological sustainability and they learn about uh, the park's <coughs> efforts at adaptive reuse and, um, and soft edge urban, urban planning instead of bulkhead urban planning, that immediately adjacent to the story about you know, 21st century contemporary engagement with the environment will be a live feed of an East River drainage pipe and all of the sewage that gets dumped in there every day. So I think it's in these little moments of sort of encouraging people to get active and get engaged with their contemporary surroundings, but to also remember that all of these things are um, kind of complicated and that although we might be working towards a goal, we still have lots to do. Another um, example would be a moment on, on one of my big onion walking tours. Um, one of my favorites is my Central Park tour. And I love that tour because people come often, I think, thinking that they're going to get you know, the same old story about Olmsted and Bo and their pretty grass and their sheep and, and that story. And that's a great story. But what I like to do when I take people through the ramble, for instance, is to start that walk through the woods with a, a discussion about crime in New York City and to talk about how crime is both a real phenomenon but also something that is a social construct and that is a product of people's own prejudices and understandings about the people who are coming in and out of the park. And that when we talk about crime in Central Park, we're talking about a whole set of social issues that still follow us to today. Laminations of you know the the tramp nuisance from 1898 and, and kind of connecting that to you know urban crime in 2015. So there's another example of sort of pushing people to think a little bit more deeply about the spaces they inhabit. And I think a lot of what I'm interested in regards to both the Brooklyn Project through the History in Action Project Award or the walking tours or just being a graduate student thinking these things through for my own dissertation is to steal from architects and urban designers, for lack of a better word today, um, the word sustainability. And to think about how history in action can push us to think about the ways we operate in the present, 
about the historical roots and contingencies of our modern concerns, and how it informs us about what not to do, about what avenues can promote dialogues towards equality, access to education, and I think most importantly, an informed citizenry. And I think it's also important to note here today that History in Action for graduate students out there does not have to conform to this model or the models that other graduate students have presented here today or, or even the other examples, the fine, excellent examples that we've seen throughout the weekend. That one of the great things about this program here at Columbia is that it's allowing graduate students to explore the many possibilities and the many avenues for the ways in which they can take their passion for this discipline, their passion for this career, and shape it into something that works for them and the things that they care about. And I know that History in Action has challenged me to think more critically about what it means to be a public historian, that it's something that has challenged me to focus and and expand my, my interest in fields as wide-ranging as policy, journalism, education reform, teaching pedagogy, all of these things um, outside of history that I now am I'm, I'm fascinated by. And I'm grateful that I've been able to explore all of these ideas in my work outside the department, but that I can also think about ways to include them um, in the process of my dissertation. And it's an exciting thing to think about as I embark on that process. And, just to quickly return to this before I conclude, um, as this project has unfolded, it's been really wonderful as a graduate student to have been welcomed into the fold of the process of, of making this exhibit possible. And I apologize that I don't have a lot of uh, images to show you today. Um, I, I came onto this panel a little bit late in the game, and I didn't get a chance to get approval from the boss <laughs> to put up pictures. But I can tell you that it's been quite incredible to collaborate with designers, with historians, with academics, with um, ecologists. Um, we have an initiative underway right now with the Wallachia team and the Manahata Project to help uh, inform our conversations about the, the very early, early history of the waterfront, you know, kind of the prehistory of the waterfront, if you will. And I think what this has, has really proven is that history in action can happen in a variety of ways through a variety of different uh, collaborative means. And, um, and I hope that as graduate students um, become more engaged in the History in Action initiative as it continues forward, that um, perhaps some of these examples might serve as a little bit of inspiration, perhaps a little bit of guidance. Um, I'm by no means an expert, but I'm happy to help. And um, I really want to thank the faculty and the graduate students who have taken the time to really build this program. Um, it's quite a privilege to be a part of that, and I thank you for that. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is George Moth. I'm a fourth year uh, graduate student in Department of History, American History. Um, I first, firstly like to thank Tanya for graciously inviting me to come speak today, and thank you to the rest of the History and Action Committee for your hard work. Um, my work deals with the history of infectious disease and chronic disease in the US. Um, but I was brought here to speak about Black Lives Matter. So um, what I will be speaking about today is necessarily about professional development per se, but um, I will try to narrate um, a moment in my life when I got, I felt a moral provocation to act um, in an in, in area that I don't study or uh, kind of uh, focus on for my, for my PhD work, but something that I felt that I had the privilege to, to do. So, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about presentism um, and social media. <laughs> um, but with presentism, I wanted to ask, what is presentism? And does an excessive fear of presentism hobble the historian's effort in engaging the public? Um, I ask this question because after reading Hunter Arendt's The Human Condition, I was very much um, inspired by the way she thought about uh, human action and thought in the 20th century. Hunter Arendt in The Human Condition distinguishes between two modes of thought. Of vita activa, the sort of actions that 
a human person, human being, a thinking person, a moral being, has to take to kind of operate and get through the world. And a vita contemplativa, the sort of moments where you recede from social life and you, you think and you reflect on life. Um, I think scholars are very, very comfortable with the latter and very uncomfortable with the former. And I want to ask us why that is and why we aren't more willing to kind of speak truth to power if we feel like we are focusing and cultivating truth and knowledge. The main problem with getting people to understand Black Lives Matter today is a problem of communication and connecting folks to resources. Um, and also having a clear ask for people, ask um, something that they can clearly do or contribute to um, the movement for justice and a movement against police brutality. But in particular, I think the problem for historians is this excessive fear of presentism and a sort of reluctance to kind of engage in uh, issues of justice that people kind of view as politically debatable or up in the air and uh, equivalent um, in terms of uh, the construction of problems. So if Black Lives Matter says police brutality is a problem, that black men are disproportionately targeted compared to the rest of the population, I don't think many reasonable people would disagree with that, but I think a lot of people would disagree with perhaps the tactics taken, for example, or um, the ways in which the problem has been framed and exposed. And this is where I think social media is really interesting because a lot of people are very critical of so-called hashtag activism, but I think social media kind of provides a useful avenue to kind of see in real time the actors um, who will be remembered in historical books that are. Um, and I also think social media provides a way to kind of create a living archive that can be used later but most importantly, that can be used in the present to kind of counteract distortions in the mainstream media or uh, inadequate accounts of the conditions of uh, places like Ferguson and the work that, and the, and the problems that activists are trying to respond to. So there are, all sort of, there are all sorts of social media tools that are available, Twitter, Facebook, Vine. Facebook is kind of the place where you go to kind of see your friends and family. Twitter is a place you go to complain, maybe. <laughs> um, Vine is a tool that's less known. It's a way, it's kind of Twitter for video. You can kind of capture short snippets and distribute them, and they kind of loop. So um, people that are really good at it, that have kind of catchy or um, interesting programming, can find a lot of followers and kind of distribute information through that. Um, but today I'm going to focus on Twitter. So how do people have cell phones with them? Raise your hand. Have what? Cell phones. Oh. Or smartphones specifically. Okay. Who has Twitter installed on their smartphone? All right. So I noticed that especially among the younger scholars, um, a lot of us have uh, Twitter accounts. But I find that they're not very often used. And I think a lot of people have worries about Twitter. They have worries about professional exposure. They have worries about politics interfering with their perception in the professional sphere. Um, I have those worries too, but I just feel compelled to not be silent. I'd rather take the risk <laughs> and getting my opinion out there and connecting with other people and using my historical training to counteract um, fallacious thinking in the record, um, but also to kind of engage and also learn from other people. Um, I think one of the great things about Twitter is that it is a great leveler, right? Um, PhD is very exclusive. It's very hard to get. 1% of the population has a PhD, and we tend to talk to one another. So um, when we talk about audience, we're very worried about ourselves, I think, when we're not worried about 99% of other people that are kind of similarly equipped or just as capable at doing historical research, at connecting people to resources. Um, so if you have your phone and if you have Twitter, I'd encourage you to whip it out right now, and we're going to go on a little exploration. So there are a number of groups and people that are doing really, really important work in um, Ferguson right now. And Ferguson is really the epicenter of the recent push to really counteract um, 
police brutality and the disproportionate treatment of black uh, men and women. One of the first people uh, that I followed is a colleague of mine, um, Doray McKesson, who uh, went to my alma mater voting college. And his Twitter handle is at Doray. Oh, well, I guess I can go to this link actually. And um, Doray is a Teach for America alum, and he spent three to four years working in the Minneapolis School District. So he's very much embedded in educational communities, embedded in, embedded in uh, and has kind of the luxury and freedom of time to kind of go to places like Ferguson because of the proximity. Um, and he's kind of known as one of the main leaders, so to speak, of the movement. But what's kind of interesting about this historical moment is how much things like Twitter and social media are kind of eschewing the kind of uh, need for a singular leader, a charismatic leader. Um, it seems that with the Black Lives Matter movement, there seems to be an appeal with not having a leader, that there's almost strength in this. And this is actually informed by historical sense. We now know, um, I don't know, how, how many of y'all have seen Selma the movie? So in Selma, not, uh, many of the scenes are interspersed with COINTELPRO lines. So many of the actors today know that they're being watched. They know that they're being recorded. Um, I've been at protests where I see police officers in the comfort of their police cars looking through Twitter on their phones to get the latest intelligence. So Twitter is not just a good or a bad thing, it's a tool. It's, it's neutral, it's what you do with it. Um, but DeRay is interesting because he's been able to kind of really use it to connect different communities, to inspire different communities. Um, if you have your phone, type into the search hashtag Selma numeral 50. And this, I guess, is a sort of impromptu tutorial in Twitter as well. So, Selma 50. So it's the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery marches, and President Obama is currently in Selma right now. Um, I guess he just spoke 37 minutes ago um, to commemorate the event. And this is one of the great things about Twitter is that you can use it to kind of get the latest information from all sorts of different actors at the scene that are kind of thinking about Selma, thinking about history in real time, really trying to connect and kind of share this information. This is especially important um, for people that are not able-bodied, people that cannot travel, who, got, who don't have financial means to get to, the, to these institutions. Um, so using kind of crowdsourcing or sort of democratic distribution of information, um, Twitter allows people to kind of connect in real time to things like Selma 50. So we typed in Psalm 50, the hashtag we see, Barack Obama's been retweeted 2,235 times. Uh, quote, we honor those who walk so we can run. We must run so our children can soar. Um, Psalm 50. Um, but if you look below, you'll see a lot less prominent figures. One of them is actually uh, uh, activist, a uh, Muslim Palestinian activist here in the city, um, Linda Sarsour, who's part of a group called Justice League. Um, and you can see under the Psalm 50 hashtag, her tweet, um, those who stand against injustice and oppression are the most patriotic and have deep love for America because they see the potential. And you click on her, on her uh, Twitter profile and you'll see information, uh, all her other tweets. Um, oftentimes people will respond to tweets so you can begin to have an engagement with them. It's very ad hoc. You don't need a formal classroom setting to kind of share history and kind of engage um, the past. Um, Linda Sarsour is affiliated with a group called the Justice League. Now the Justice League uh, New York City is one of the kind of preeminent social, uh, kind of direct action groups that were doing a lot of the shut it down actions in New York City to kind of keep the focus on um, Eric Garner. And that's actually kind of how I got involved. Um, on December 30th, that's when the grand jury decision not to indict Danny Pantaleo came down. That was also the last night of my revisions from my dissertation perspectives. <laughs> so I'm editing my dissertation perspectives. I'm sorry, Professor Kessler Harris, to hear, to hear this. Um, and I could have done a little bit more, I guess, but I was very frustrated. Um, I had a very emotional response because um, I knew that there was a strong possibility that Daniel Pantaleo would not be indicted, but 
to kind of see the news as I was kind of sitting at a cafe, very comfortable, kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I felt out of sorts of it. And I know that this is a constant struggle that I've had is how do I balance the need to get my PhD work done and remain engaged? And at that moment, knowing that I'd have a two week hiatus from <laughs> submitting uh, revisions, I just decided to send it off to my committee and get involved. So that night, um, I just went out and I used Twitter. I used Twitter to find out where the latest protests were. I wasn't very successful. I couldn't find the protests, they were all over the place. But um, a lot, I think a lot of other people were in that similar situation. But December 4th, December 5th, December uh, 6th, that's when things really got going. There was a repertoire that was happening uh, in real time. People were able to coordinate, people were able to find one another. Um, we had actions in Grand Central Station, which became a sort of HQ of sorts, where people could kind of meet and kind of keep attention on this issue. We shut down streets, we inconvenienced people. Um, it's not all fun and games and civil, but it was necessary in my opinion, because um, it really did elevate what, was, what, what has been an endemic problem in our communities, but it really did kind of highlight the power of something like Twitter. So whenever someone's very kind of flippant about hashtag activism or flippant about the value of Twitter, I always think about the very practical use and the very um, con the, the convenience that it brought to me to kind of connect me to movement leaders. Um, so Justice League was one of the groups that were out on the front lines. Um, they used their Twitter to highlight petitions that they want to deliver. They have a petition with 10 major demands for reform in New York City. They met with Mayor de Blasio and they used Twitter to kind of share news and um, engage the public to recruit volunteers who may not be able to do this full time but who care very deeply about it. And um, Twitter's been really, really great for this. I think another important point though is that Black Lives Matter isn't simply about police brutality and the disproportionate treatment of black men and women. Uh, it has helped people kind of connect and think about root causes and think in a more radical critique about what is causing violence and what is causing antagonism between police officers and the community members. And one of the really, really promising uh, organizations that are putting in uh, work, really serious, important work, is, uh, an oper uh, is an organization called Operation Help or Hush. I love that name because it tells all the cynics to just sit down if you're gonna just gonna complain. So, um, and what, they, what, uh, what Operation Help or Hush does is um, build transitional housing in the Ferguson community. Ferguson is very poor and under-resourced and what uh, one of my friends Charles Wade and uh, his organization does is buy up apartments to allow people to affordably live um, or have a place to stabilize their lives, homeless people typically stabilize their lives, find some employment, hopefully connect them to resources in the welfare state and to help transition them out so that they have a kind of stable base. And um, this, was a, this, this is something that really got um, more, of, more push, more of a movement after Ferguson and after people were thinking about what are some of the other root causes that need to be addressed beyond stop and frisk, beyond uh, mass incarceration in our carceral policies, what else can we do like housing, education, and help improve outcomes. And so this is kind of an instance where um, t Twitter is a tool that really enables solidarities. We think and worry a lot about the decline of things like unions, right? Very formal institutions um, that may have formally done a lot of this work. And unions are actually, unions, um, various civic groups have been very important to this, but Twitter is a, has really helped speed up the process and catalyze the process for a new generation of leaders. Um, and so this is an instance where social media leads to new structures, right? It's not necessarily rooted in as solid a sense, uh, as solidly in the state as we may, uh, as some may want it to be, for example, in terms of longevity and funding and resources, but it does allow communities, I don't live in Ferguson, you don't live in Ferguson, but you could be following this on Twitter and may contribute $10, and imagine how that can scale up for these communities. So Twitter is really, really amazing for this. And if you're an active user, you know, AP Help or Hush, Hush would maybe uh, announce a sort of fundraising drive. Uh, we have nine apartments who would like to increase to 12 apartments to come help us. They send out a link. You may not contribute, but you retweet, and that has a sort of velocity 
in this kind of space where other people may see that and may choose to contribute. And ten dollars from a thousand people is quite significant money, right? Um, so this is these are ways in which Twitter can ha kind of help lead to new structures that can kind of help address some of the aspects of the problem that aren't seen as relevant in a five inch news story, for example. And another, another really important point, I think, and I think a point that would be really interesting for historians of the future, looking back on Twitter as an archival source, is the sort of intergenerational debate um, that is occurring currently in the Black Lives Matter movement. So DeRay, who I showed you here, um, and his sort of partner in crime, Netta, Janetta Elzey, um, both of whom were actually um, recently awarded uh, the Howard Zinn Penn Award for their engagement with the public. Um, let me see if I can find that out. Well, I can't find that page, but um, both of these leaders have um, really had a uh, sort of debates with a lot of the movement leaders, particularly uh, folks like Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, who kind of see themselves as inheritors of the sort of classic civil rights movement and see themselves as the rightful heirs and kind of lambast the Black Lives Matters movement as being unorganized, undisciplined, leaderless, and these are all uh, ipso facto bad for the movement. And they're saying, no, uh, we prefer not having charismatic leadership, we prefer allowing people to have, to develop and practice a sense of political efficacy on their own. We prefer using Twitter as a way to kind of engage with communities on different ge geographies. We don't want to be bound um, to one approach or one person. Um, and so it's been really interesting as a historian and not as one of the kind of key leaders to kind of observe this debate because as a historian, I, you know, all, all I've had up till now is those, are those um, civil rights narratives, those narratives from the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and it's very interesting to kind of see living history, to kind of see the sort of intellectual debates about tactics and mission play out in real life, and to be able to almost intervene, almost, and say, um, well, that idea you have about, um, you know, maybe, you know, sit-in actions isn't necessarily very new. This was done in Greensboro, North Carolina, and we smile as historians because it's very common knowledge to us, but a lot of people that are 17, 18, 19 that are engaging on these platforms don't know that. And um, especially when we think about educational curricula on the K-12 level, they're not really focusing on these issues. So this is really a way for me to kind of be able to share that knowledge in a very low stakes way um, with um, young people. So what's next? What can historians sort of contribute to uh, Black Lives Matter and or to your own sort of projects using tools like Twitter? Um, I love these ideas about building mobile resources, taking things to communities, building uh, buses. I know that, uh, I wish I wrote this down now, I, didn't, I couldn't predict it, but there is a pro project in Newark that's trying to uh, build up a mobile uh, laptop system, and it would be great to use Twitter to kind of connect with it and similar work to see whether resources can be corralled, whether um, grant funding schemes could be shared, you know? Um, a lot of community members have the vision, but they don't have the privilege or the access to funding that we have. And we can easily, easily, we, we're, we do this for a living, we apply for money all the time. So why don't, why don't we share those skills um, with people who don't have access to Columbia and the benefit of advisors that can like read uh, a grant proposal very um, closely. Um, legal observation, uh, we're all PhDs, but I'm sure we know many lawyers. Um, and we need people that can connect um, protesters or people that are dealing on much uh, uh, more involved projects like transitional housing with legal counsel, pro bono legal counsel. Um, I'm not sure if the uh, legal history clinic or uh, law and oral history clinic, for example, could uh, be involved in this, but we all have kind of connections to people that um, can easily be leveraged through things like Twitter. Um, to allow people to kind of get at least some material, or not material uh, help, but at least some advice about next steps or where they can go. Um, op-eds, I think op-eds are very important. Historians can write well typically, so we should be exercising uh, our historical research and our insights 
to kind of help counteract simplistic narratives in the mainstream media. And I think oral history is very, very important. Um, it's something that's very, uh, that's capable and within our skill set. Um, uh, now that I'm thinking about just brainstorming off the top of my head, it seems that the internet can also be used as a tool to do oral history. Um, Romeo's very knowledgeable about this, I guess, in terms of his um, work with CMAP, but uh, you know, I'm just imagining using something like Skype even to kind of try to get some of these perspectives from people who don't have the material needs to kind of travel to a place um, or have someone travel to them. And then um, engagement with public schools. Um, last week I recently uh, met with uh, high schoolers at Columbia Secondary School. Um, and uh, I tend to like to break down sort of, sort of panels, make them a little more democratic, have uh, question and answer back and forth. And I asked the students, you know, what are some of the issues that you're facing? What could you um, possibly, uh, what, do you, what do you feel is not being heard? Like, what problems are you having? And it quickly became apparent that um, the school Students felt that the school was losing its diversity, that the change in profile on the Morningside Heights uh, campus uh, was changing the sort of uh, legacy of diversity of black and Latino students at the Columbia Secondary School. And um, students also felt that they weren't allowed to organize a black students' union. And it was very interesting that it took an outsider to kind of come in and kind of break down privilege and hierarchy and deferential behavior to kind of get students to be honest and to uh, imagine possibilities that can start, maybe you can start a club, see if you can start a petition, see if you can um, get a committee together to work with, uh, with your principals to kind of talk about some of these issues and fears that you have. And the students became animated. They started kind of talking to one another. Um, so I guess I'll wrap up. Um, I just would like to push all of us to kind of reconsider this fear of presentism. Um, I mean, I define presentism as using the present to interpret the past, very plainly put. But I think there's lots of shades to that, and we shouldn't just run, it's, it's not, I, I, I think presentism is more phantom than actual thing. And if it is a thing, we need to do a better job of uh, defining what are the parts of presentism that the historian should be very cognizant of in terms of her historical practice. And one of the parts of presentism that we, or the fears of presentism that we can maybe relax or let, let go of, particularly in emergency situations, particularly in contingent moments in, in the present when we know we have, if you're moral and you have a sort of sense of justice and injustice, you know you have a unique capacity to kind of speak to certain issues. And it doesn't have to be necessarily Black Lives Matter, but what are those moments that we need to kind of think about in terms of uh, engagement in the present as historians. Um, what is deleterious to the practice and the craft of history in terms of presentism and what is not so deleterious? It's not so much a, pro a, a matter of us creating monographs and having people come to us and uh, talking down to them. It's actually kind of coming to them, helping them produce uh, knowledge, knowledge that, they, that, that they have about their communities. Um, you know, the news, for example, of the DOJ report about uh, uh, disproportionate abuse by the Ferguson Police Department of black residents is not, was not surprising to me. If you were following Twitter for the past six months, you should not be surprised by that report. And yet the New York Times has three days of coverage, um, breaking news coverage, that, oh, breaking news, Ferguson has a problem here with, uh, uh, with disproportionate policing. Um, and I think, you know, if you kind of spend even a week, uh, one hour a week, <laughs> even 15 minutes, you know, spread out over the days, engaging with these communities and networks, you'll become much more informed um, about kind of the framing of Black Lives Matter, the framing of the problem of mass incarceration and police abuse. Um, and also, you'll not only be able to be a passive um, observer, but an active participator. Um, you can ask questions, you can see when these uh, activists who are actually putting in work every day when they need help and where you can help them and meet them at where they are. And the needs are contingent and varied and it just requires uh, being open to uh, the public, but an audience that might actually be more informed and may actually connect you to different perspectives than what, we've, that, than what we have in the library or what we have from our own professors um, or what we're doing in our own research.
Um, so I think that social media is very, very promising in terms of building solidarities, not just in terms of political agreement, but in terms of um, building up structures and sharing resources and helping sustain um, a movement until justice has been achieved. Thank you. Um, we can begin a conversation, then have a little break, and then regroup about that. Uh, so I think I'm the traffic uh, officer here, so I'll, I'll follow people. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for your this panel. Um, George, I, I wonder if you could think about or tell us how, what, uh, how you might go about connecting your um, interest in social media to your dissertation project on, on public health. I mean, just in terms of how could you use the kinds of tools that you taught us to use, thank you, um, uh, in, in a tweet and so on in your dissertation? Um, I, I, I do, I do use it um, for my dissertation research. Um, I did focus more on that Black Lives Matter. Sure, before. yeah. So. Um, but I do use it. I mean, I uh, just the other, like I think two weeks ago, um, I was able to kind of jump in on a panel that some of the uh, an extra person uh, participated in, and that was because uh, a colleague of mine at Temple University knew me and was able to connect me to Twitter, and it just happened so quickly. We were laughing to, to one another over email about how easy this was. Um, so that's that's one application. Um, in terms of my research, you know, I mean, I'm at a stage now where I'm doing empirics. I'm looking for paper and. <laughs> but I do envision a sort of role in terms of uh, oral history, so using it as a sort of directory or census of sorts to find information and connect me with a lot of the um, AIDS actors, for example, that are still alive. Um, um, many of them I've actually kind of, uh, some of them I've met actually through uh, formal, uh, through some kind of social contacts, but who I kind of maintain a relationship with through um, things like Facebook or Twitter. Um, so those are kind of relationships that I, you know, look forward to kind of Developing in the future, um, whether it's I, whether it's uh, you know we rendezvous when I'm you know. And what about dissemination? Dissemination. Dissemination. Um. Of your research, or of your. Of my work, yeah. I mean, yeah. Who knows? I mean, I've seen very promising models in terms of, um, especially established scholars who are kind of sought out, who are able to kind of be in dialogue with students who are interested in their work. So um, I feel like you know this is something that a lot of people are getting involved with, with things like academia.edu, for example, uploading papers, um, and, then, and then tweeting out or sharing on Facebook, uh, you know, uploading of new information. Um, but I think, you know, I think social media is never really effective outside of real life action, like the Vita Activa, you know? It's best when it's, um, for example, at a conference, if, you know, we have the HIA hashtag, and that allows people outside of the university to kind of share and, and yeah, get on that. Um, and, and maybe allows an audience members even to kind of uh, ask questions. Um, so it's very ad hoc. I don't have a, I don't have this kind of perfect vision. It's just I, I, I use it as a tool. I do things. And so when the need comes up, I'll do it. I mean, I think the reality is also that Twitter is going to be the archive. Mm -hmm. And it's the and so in part the the reality is, it, I mean, it already is an archive, but we're going to have to figure out, as historians, how we are going to engage it. I mean, so I wrote about AIDS, so it's the moment that that the computer, I mean, so you're, it, the reality is that this is what history, historians are going to have to figure out how to do it, and there are some who are going to have to figure it out sooner than others, but the reality is that we, we have to start to make some of that stuff yeah, for, for concrete because it's what it's going to be. And one title I would recommend is um, Claire Potter's Doing Recent History. It's a really great primer on using new unconventional sources like v, uh, v, VHS tapes, um, websites, tweets, just thinking through the methodologies of using uh, social media and media in our work. Just to add to that, um, before the big event on Saturday, where we're going to show the film, uh, what we actually did was, uh, it was like Thursday night, we wrote a 1,000 word essay to sort of invite the community, um, tell them what we knew, what we were going to explore, and ask them to show up. Um, and in that, we put a picture of the mural with uh, four youngsters, they're adults now, but they were young men. Um, and 
it sort of circulated on Facebook, I kind of forgot about it, and then a couple weeks later, um, I realized there was an entire conversation that was locating those individuals. Um, one of them had died, but other ones were like all there, right? So at some point, I'm not sure how, one of them emailed me and was like, hey, are you that dude? Because I know these people in these photographs, right? So it's also becoming a really useful way to track people down. not get our Twitter handle up and running in time, but we do have one, but we're not tweeting the slides. I'm really grateful now that Emily is doing it for us for the AHA. Please do follow it. Is it history in action? It's AHA Career Diversity, which is the library of programs that we have part. So thank you very much, and I'm sure ours will be up and running soon. Well, Sarah's working on it, so we'll have it. Um, Romeo, I had a question to you. Um, I thought it was a fascinating presentation, and I've been reading some of your work, but it's very different to see the work visually than from reading the essays in the reader. And I, my question was about the community's response to your efforts, to, from the initial skepticism about who are you, and you, you don't even live here anymore, to how do they look at these events that you build now, how do they feel about it, and basically how has this conversation been going on for a while? And I'll just ask something to Katie before you come to the answer. Katie, I have one very, I'm, I'm coming for one of your tours before we're done with Columbia, but I'm curious, how do you tell a, a bunch of tourists that this is a social construct? Do you say a social construct? <laughs> 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 they say, what do you say, this is real, it exists, what do you mean by, so I'm curious about how you talk to them because we've talked so much about language. I mean, I think community engagement is very much like becoming a neighbor, right? Like when you move in, um, and they have to continue to, who are you? Like, where are you coming from? Right? So the more people see us um, doing work, the easier it is to buy it, right? So the first time we did this, um, the mayor from Atlanta was really great. He understood it automatically. It was it. Not the Atlanta mayor it was a little bit, a little bit weird. He hadn't seen us. Like, who are you guys? I've never seen you at my park. He said it was his park. Um, so at some point, we thought, okay, like, we're not going to win that one. Um, but I ran into one of the customers at the bar, and someone introduced me to a beer, and then we had a conversation, and at some point, he got it, right? So I think the more community members see you, and the different iterations and opportunities you have to understand what you're talking about, um, the better. So throughout the project, even from the beginning, we tag community members either um, help us through all these reviews or take us to their homes. So there's always been buying, but the buying increases um, the more they get to know you and see you. Um, I, I wonder if I may ask you a question of the three of you, that's all right. Katie. Oh, Katie, I'm sorry. That's I okay. apologize, I'm sorry. Um, so, <laughs> the social construct question, uh, it's, I'm definitely, I try to be more subtle than that. Um, so I can give another example. Um, so there's the, the one that I mentioned in my um, talk was uh, the social park where we talk about crime. But another uh, instance that I can think of, um, at Brooklyn Historical Society, um, I rewrote their architectural building tour to be a social history of Brooklyn through the lens of the building. And um, one of the, two of the stops on the tour um, involve inside and outside the building. And we walk outside the building, we stand on the opposite street corner from the Brooklyn Historical Society, we look back at the building, and I ask people to tell me, who do you see on this building? Because BHS has a series of busts along um, the roof line. And each one of those busts um, are men from antiquity, um, a lot of, there's Beethoven, there's Benjamin Franklin, there's um, uh, Gutenberg, um, there's a, like a, a Norse figure and the Native American, and, and then I, I say, okay, well who is not here? And we, we, we break that down and, and we eventually come to the conclusion, well, there are, there are not many people of color um, and there's no, there are no women on the building. So then I say, okay, you know, keep that in mind, and we're going to return to that. Keep your eyes peeled throughout the building, and let's talk about that again. The tour concludes with a stop at um, an art piece installed inside the building um, by an artist um, whose name is escaping me right now, but it's a, a, a replica bust, same scale and size as the ones found on the outside of the building. So when you're face to face with it, it's huge, um, and it's a Rose Ward, um, or Pinky, who, uh, for those of you familiar with um, your uh, 19th century history, she was an African-American woman uh, who was a participant in one of Henry Ward Beecher's uh, mock slave auctions at the Church of the Pilgrims in Brooklyn. 
And, um, and this bust um, was created um, in homage to that story and then offers us an opportunity to talk about doing history in the changing world, doing history in a historical society that is, that, uh, is you know, linked to its roots as, a, as a, a private institution, but also trying to push the boundaries of whose stories are told um, within its walls. And so we, we, kind of, we kind of get to that through those visuals. I wonder if I might ask the three of you a question. It, it seems to me that in different ways each of you is engaging questions of place, um, Katie and Romeo especially, you know, and, and explicitly the kind of work you're doing. But George, in a way, you're suggesting that we can use Twitter and other media to learn more about Ferguson, for example. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I can frame this question as precisely as I'd like, but I, I wonder if one or more of you could comment on the ways in which social media and digital technology um, can enhance our understanding of place, or does it present a problem for our knowledge of place? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to answer that. So um, that's actually one of the major questions that's come up in the course of, of trying to design this waterfront exhibit, is how do you, how do you tell like, a million year history uh, to a, a pretty informal audience? And I say informal in the sense that uh, the, the museum in Dumbo at the Empire Stores will be right off of Brooklyn Bridge Park. So our audience is going to be predominantly tourists and visitors to the park. Um, and so one of the ways in which we're trying to incorporate digital technologies is both as a way to bring people into the space, but also to um, kind of engage with them once they're in the space. And, and um, one instance is we're working on um, what we're calling a, a water log right now, which is a digital interactive um, immersive video experience in which um, visitors to the um, exhibit will sort of experience the million year history of the waterfront through visuals. Um, whether that's projections on the floor to make it feel as if you're standing in the East River to um, sort of an overhead projection of, of the various built changes over time. And it allows us to sort of eschew the traditional timeline, if you will, to sort of walk through history and sort of experience history as something that happens around you um, over time. So that's, that's one example. And, and actually, um, I didn't say this, but the project archive is actually supposed to be a digital archive. Um, and that's why we're working with our friends from Mexico City. Um, because for them, um, to three, they have a, they recuperated a sort of space that was really important for anarchism. And the archive is, they get a computer so that the entire space can be an actual intellectual living environment, right? So we actually, then part of the, this archive will eventually be a digital archive. Um, but we have no money, so we'll see when it happens. But one of the ways in which we're thinking about the digital is through storytelling. Um, and how to map stories. So one of the things that we collected, um, again, after you know, some oral history, we wrote an essay, and then we published it, and then we had an event uh, for punk. Um, and punk becomes really important in South Monte and suburbs everywhere, but the reason punk is important in this community is because it's, it's close to East LA, but East LA has a very dense geography. Um, South Monte is sort of agricultural and rural at the same time, so there's all this space for punks to like just do shows. So we collected um, somewhere between like 50 and 60 flyers that of course have addresses. And of course this is before Facebook and this is before like digital technology, right? So just to give one brief example, we can start to map where people were having punk games, right? But we can also map where they were hanging out before they went to the punk games. Um, so there is a way in which it's only through the digital where you can potentially take all these things together and make sense of them spatially, right? So it's a weird relationship between thinking that technology actually facilitates sophisticated conversation around space, where before it, it, you'd have to look at all these flyers together. I don't know, so I think there's, there's something to be said about that. And in the context of Ferguson, if you go to the wetheprotesters.org website, there's something called mapping police violence, and um, the JavaScript is not enabled on this website, but uh, there's supposed to be a sliding scale that shows each date and each instance of an officer-involved shooting. You can also go down and see data like chances of being killed by police in 2014, unarmed deaths, deaths by month, by gender, cause of death, age, condition. And so there's some data that can be kind of compiled and like sort of um, presented very easily on, on the web. Yeah. 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 Y
And I just want to say one more thing. Um, and you might think this is cool. One of the projects that we did for this archive project was um, photographing trees. Um, and now we applied to a grant to sort of think with LACMA to build an app that would sort of tell stories about trees in our community. Uh, and of course, a lot of different things happen, right? Like the relationship between our community members and nature, but also um, health, right? I mean, we're talking about, for those of you who know the LA Drive, we're talking about palm trees, like, that have no value at all, right? And yet they're everywhere, and there's only trees, and there's no shade. So there's all these ways in which, like, technology helps us bridge all these different intersections that are exciting. So maybe we'll take one more question and then take a break. Yeah. Now, use of digital media to record, let us say, the mural paintings. Uh, some people call it graffiti, I call them murals. Uh, when I was running for mayor in 2013, at that moment, Rebel Diaz was having a collective, an arts collective, a musical collective in New York City, and the police raided it and destroyed it. So the next night, we had a concert. Uh, Mark Mason, graduate of Columbia, head of the African American History Department at Fordham, and I were down there with a bunch of other people, and Rebel Diaz put on in front of the concert. But across the street were these fabulous murals. And I'm wondering if, if there's an opportunity to record this before it is destroyed. Uh, but certainly a digital re retrospective, or in the case of Katie for the Bronx, if somebody's up there, to go around and point out these uh, fantastic uh, artistic uh, murals. Sure. I mean, so an, an example of, I can't speak exactly to that particular phenomenon, but I can say that um, I'm teaching a course this spring to high schoolers um, at the Museum of the City of New York and about historic preservation. And one of our activities, one of our classes, deals with the preservation or um, or lack of, I, of, uh, of preservation for um, public art and, and graffiti um, and thinking about the sort of debates over the preservation of this art form, whether as sort of an ephemeral piece of art in the street, whether it's part of the same parameters that, say, apply to a building or a, um, or a central park uh, landscape, and just kind of encouraging these high schoolers to sort of think through the public art in their communities and, and how that relates to historic preservation, I think, is an important an important question to ask. Um, and I and I think that it's something that is at the kind of in the middle of the debates about historic preservation right now. I think it's very current and very pressing. I remember following that uh, with a lot of interest. Um, one of the things that happened with the graffiti inventory forms is automatically we said, "Oh, like I know who works on this. Let's have them write an essay." And then we were like, "That's so boring." Like, why would we do that, right? And then we thought, okay, well, let's let's go tag the entire city um, with these tags. And obviously, that's not going to happen either. Um, but there's something about the digital, right? Like, what if we start projecting these tags onto the space they, they used to exist, right? Um, that's transgressive, and it's okay. The city's not going to get mad about that. Or what if we create an exhibit of the city with like these photographs or these tags superimposed onto the city? So there's all these ways in which like, the digital just opens up conversations that you think, you know, seem counterintuitive, right? But the digital just all these things, right? Okay, well, we'll have a chance to continue this conversation, but for the time being, let's thank our three panelists.